So here's chapter 3. The first two lessons we did was men shall be lovers of their own selves. The reason we did that in two lessons, part 1 and part 2, is because I initially had... um, well, I initially just covered part uh, verse 1 and the first part of verse 2. Men shall be lovers of their own self. And then I re-included them and um, went on through verse 9. And um, when we get through the review and get into this week's lesson, it's a shifting of gears. With, in, in view of what he just is telling us, he then shifted to something else. So we'll get to that in a moment. So, again, in review, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Here's why. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And I made a note there, men who love their own selves become even more covetous. I mean, these are things we all struggle with as humanity. Um, We love ourselves. Um, We can covet we can boast, we can be proud. I hope we don't get into the blasphemous part. Uh, a lot of disobedient to parents when we're growing up. And and my goodness, how unthankful uh, we sometimes are and occasionally unholy in the sense of conduct. We are always holy because we're in God's pile of stuff. But the fact that he's talking about the last days... He's in essence saying, yeah, this stuff has been true of mankind forever, but it's going to go up a notch now. Now it's going to get even greater. And so we covered those things. Um, And then, verse 3, besides the things mentioned in verse uh, 2, he said, and lack normal affection for their families. Jesus talked about that from time to time. How, how parents and children would uh, betray one another, and um, here's what he, what Paul's saying: they're going to lack the most normal of all affection, and that's family affection. Whether it's a husband and his wife, whether it's a parent and the child, whether it's a child and a sibling, or the child toward his parents, uh, that's the most normal of all kinds of love, and. Paul said when men become lovers of their own selves, they're going to lack normal affection for their families. They will refuse to make peace with anyone. Boy, do we see that in the body of politics right now. They will be slanderers, lack self-control, be brutal, and have no love for what is good. And in verse 4, they will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure, rather than God. And um, that that gets down to the nitty gritty right there. Why is the world going in the world of America, the, the world that we're familiar with, why is it going the way it is? Why is everything being transformed in America? Because people are loving pleasure more than loving God. So they have to have a a plan to make what has been abnormal for centuries normal. And uh, then they bring God into it and said, God made people this way. And, and then you become a hater if you disagree with them. And they want to get these things in the courts proclaimed as hate speech, which means it would be illegal to say certain things, which means if the church preaches the scripture, they will be accused of hate speech which is illegal. That's where they're trying to drag us all along with them uh, into this reality. And so, certainly these things Paul's talking about to Timothy, we're seeing play it out right now. Verse 5, They will go on pretending to be devoted to God, but they will refuse to let that devotion change the way they live. Stay away from these people. We have politicians that say they're Christians, but they keep saying what God said is right is wrong, and they keep saying what God said is wrong is right. So they have, to some extent, a devotion to God, 
We'll get to that in today's lesson. But it's not a genuine devotion to God. It's a misled, uh, just whacked out thing because they're not allowing this devotion to lead them into obedience to God. Verse 6, Some of them will go into homes and get control over weak women whose lives are full of sin, women who are led into sin by all the things they want. So um, the lover of self wants uh, to gain the confidence of women who desire things contrary to the Scripture. Uh, again, um, I mean, you just you get where we're at in America today. Uh, ever since the uh, 70s, we've been allowed to kill babies in this country. About 300 a day right now in America are being aborted every day. And now they're not satisfied. That's not enough. Now they want if the baby is born and the mother changes her mind well healthy babies lying there the physician and the mother can decide to terminate it and God's watching all this and so we're just in a we can't you know think of everything addiction when you get addicted to gambling it takes more and more to satisfy when you get addicted to alcohol it takes more and more to satisfy you. When you get addicted to drugs, it takes a greater amount uh, to get a high. And uh, when you get addicted to pleasure, it takes more and more perversion to satisfy. And when you get addicted to loving yourself, nothing else matters. Everything makes sense to you. Fifteen, twenty years ago, I think, I heard a woman say, I couldn't believe it, that she thought women should have up to two years after the baby's born to decide whether or not to abort. I thought, that is crazy. All of a sudden, we're seeing the beginning of the groundwork for that. A baby can lie there healthy, where it's no longer about the mother or the physician. And their argument is, the mother and the physician ought to make that choice. <laughs> not with a living person. What if me and my physician want to shoot you, bud? Should you leave it to me and my physician? That's just retarded. But, again, when you love your own self, it takes more and more to gratify your flesh. And it's another kind of addiction. Uh, verse 7, Such women are forever following new teachings, but they never understand the truth. I tell you, we're hearing everything out there today. Um, and... People are buying into it. Not just women. People in general. I put an, uh, That's where we're at in America today. We create our own God. Call Him the God of the Bible and label, label everyone who disagrees as haters. That's uh, unfortunate. Uh, verse 8. Now as Jamus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate, reprobate concerning the faith. Verse 9. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as happened with Janus and Jambus. Now, I'm convinced, I have more notes on that uh, when I taught that lesson, but I'm convinced, this was the uh, concluding note, that it's not going to get better until after the tribulation period and uh, the uh, is over. So, it's not getting better anytime soon. We've got at least seven years if the tribulation starts tomorrow. So now we go on and go to 10, verses 10 to 17, which will complete chapter 3, and we'll only have one more chapter left. Verse 10, Walking out what the Scriptures teach. But thou hast fully known... Now remember, he's writing to Timothy. This is the, his second letter to Timothy, the second epistle of Timothy. So... This letter is from Paul to Timothy. But because it's the Word of God, we can all get something out of it. But right now, he's addressing Timothy. But thou hast known my doctrine. Timothy, you know what I teach, Paul telling him. Now, the word doctrine simply means what you teach. Uh, thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. The New Living Translation renders that verse this way. But you know what I teach, Timothy. 
and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith and how long I have suffered. You know my love and my patient endurance. Easy to read version. Sometimes when you get into these other versions, the reason I include them there is because uh, they're paraphrased and sometimes they're clearer in our understanding exactly what it is that Paul's writing here. So here in the easy to read version, but you know all about me. You know what I teach and the way I live. You know my goal in life. You know my faith, my patience, and my love. You know that I never stop trying. In other words, he just is patient and keeps at it and keeps at it. So, what important things about Paul did he want Timothy to remember? He wanted him to remember his doctrine, the style of life he lived, and his purpose in life. What did these qualities produce in Paul? They produced faith in God, the ability to endure suffering, and love and patience. So what are you and I gleaning from this? That's the important part. He's writing to Timothy, but what's in it for us? We as modern day believers need to understand Paul's doctrine. We need to emulate his strong desire to live out what he taught. And we need to live our lives with a purpose, that purpose being to do whatever God wants us to do. Paul wrote a couple times in epistles, follow me as I follow Jesus. So in essence, he's telling his readers, you need an example, look at me. I tell you, this man knew his relationship with God, didn't he? He said, you need an example, someone to set the example, I'm, I've set it. Do what I do. And so, basically, that's what he's telling Timothy. And so, for you and I, we need to understand Paul's doctrine, which is the grace of Almighty God. Again, the gospel we call it. The gospel, I say it over and over, is the only message on this planet that can get you to heaven. There is no other message. There's a lot of other churches, or religions, I should say. Even churches. But if that church preaches anything but the gospel... They don't have the message that gets people to heaven. If it's a PC church, they're not a church. They can call themselves a church all day long, but if they're preaching political correctness instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're deceiving people. They might think they're right. They might just buy into this God is love and say because God is love, He's okay with whatever anybody's doing. But it's not what the Bible teaches. About four different times, Paul... Uh, three times for Paul I think Paul gives us a list of bad conduct and in Galatians 5 when he gave a list of bad conduct was somebody knocking? what? oh on the speaker? what? did it come from up there? Or? it did? nobody pounding on our door all right. Um, but anyway, uh, what I was saying is the doctrine of Paul, talking about the grace of God, he included list, like in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, he, he gave us list of bad conduct. And in Galatians... 5 verses 19 to 21 at the end of that list of bad conduct you know what he said and I'm going to tell you what I've told you before anyone who does these things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven so he wasn't talking about anyone who commits a sin but rather he was saying anyone who embraces sin anyone whose life is one of embracing sin things that are contrary to the gospel is not a real Christian. That's Paul's argument. So even though he's the one who taught us grace, I had a guy tell me one time, you always talk about Paul and grace, but you haven't shown me any. And I said, well, you know, the Bible tells me, Paul tells me, the same guy who taught me grace said that 
if there's anyone among you who calls himself a brother and is an adulterer, don't so much as eat with them. So how can I believe what he says about the gospel and not believe what he says about that? So within the realm of grace, there are judgments to be made. And they're not pleasant. They never are. But am I going to say Paul's wrong there and right here? The Scripture is the Scripture. But Paul has the only message for who will ever listen to it that can get someone from planet Earth to heaven. And that message he refers to as the Gospel. And it's the message of salvation by grace alone. We can't do a thing to earn it. We have to receive it as a gift from God. But then he also teaches if we receive that gift of salvation, we become new creatures. I explained to my Catholic uh, friend at work when we were on break. He said, you don't think you have to do anything good to go to heaven? And I said, not a thing. Nothing I've ever done is good enough to get me to heaven. He said, then why do you do good stuff? Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature created unto good works. When you put your faith in God, He reconfigures you, if you please. And you become a brand new creature. And He creates you to do good. He rewires you. He gets you wired to do what He wants. So you can't become a Christian and desire to live the same life you've always lived. You are changed. You're a new creature. So this idea that God just loves us all the way we are, yes, He does, but He loves us too much to leave us that way. And that's the thing we have to remember. So uh, we need to understand Paul's doctrine just like he reminded Timothy what Paul taught, which is the most beautiful teaching of Scripture outside of the crucifixion, the demonstration of the the Son of God to show us how much He loved us by dying for us uh, and, and taking the wrath of God that we have earned for the wages of sin is death and suffered it Himself so that we wouldn't have to. That beautiful story. But as far as Bible teaching, the most beautiful doctrine of all is the doctrine of grace. But within the realms of that doctrine of grace, it excludes phoniness. It excludes phoniness. We don't get to be phony, say we love God, and have no desire to obey Him. It's one thing to have a desire to obey Him and to fail. It's quite another to have no desire to obey Him. And we have been recreated in Christ Jesus and our hearts pant after God. Flip it over if you would. After Paul talks about what he wants Timothy to remember about him, uh, on verse 1 there, or verse 10 rather, now in verse 11 he continues to remind Timothy of something else. Not only um, those things that I told you here, you also know this about me thing that he suffered. He says in verse 11, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Remember, he's writing from death row right now when he writes this letter. And he'll tell Timothy in chapter 4 that he doesn't plan on getting out of this one. But because God hadn't been done with him yet, all those persecutions and afflictions he had endured up to the time of the writing of this letter, God had delivered him out of. Now, what's he reminding Timothy here? He's so passionate about what he believes that he's willing to suffer physically for it. You know, I don't know. I hope I'm there. If I'm not, I hope in the trial God will get me there. Because we don't really believe it if we're willing to lay it aside at the first inconvenience. And I hate to be the purveyor of bad news, but America is getting closer and closer to an absolute hate affair with the evangelical church. They want to outlaw certain things we teach. 
and call it hate speech. If they can get the Supreme Court to call it hate speech, we'll be breaking the law if we teach that homosexuality is sin. They're wanting to make us lawbreakers because they don't like people in the name of Christ saying that homosexuality is a sin. They say you're a hater. There's all kinds of sins. Alcoholism is a sin. I don't hate people who are alcoholics. Drug addiction is a sin. I don't hate drug addicts. Heterosexual sin that's not between a husband and wife is sin. Or heterosexual acts, I mean, um, sex. I'll get it right. Heterosexual sex that is not between a husband and wife is sin. I don't hate people who uh, fall into that. I don't hate people who live in it. But they need to be taught the truth and get out of it if they're saying they're a Christian. Um, So this idea that because I believe homosexuality is sin that I hate homosexuals is ludicrous. I will not allow them to define me. I am not a hater of homosexuals. But I'll tell you who is a hater. The ones who tell me I'm a hater. They hate me. They've never met me. But they hate me. Because I'm an evangelical preacher who believes the Bible is yea and amen. I believe words matter in the Constitution and I believe words matter in the Scripture. So we're, we're getting in a pickle where some of the things Paul experienced might be coming to the American church. It's coming to the church around the world already. They're dying all over the planet. And it could come to America. I don't want it to. I love America. Don't want it to. But it sure seems to be heading that direction. So, uh, already, we've got people that go into churches and shoot it up. That's why when I heard something, I thought, uh, but then I thought, no, that can't be it, because they won't knock before they came in and shot it. <laughs> Can I come in and shoot you? <laughs> you know, they probably wouldn't do that. Uh, but that was my first reaction. Why somebody pounding at our front door? Uh, but anyway, verse 12. After after he said in verse 11, besides all those things about my doctrine, my lifestyle, my purpose in life, about all that stuff, he said, you also know how I've suffered for him. And then he says this sobering thing in verse 12. And all, and all, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Living Bible. Yes, those who decide to please Christ Jesus by living godly lives will suffer at the hands of those who hate Him. The Amplified. Indeed, all who delight in piety and are determined to live a devoted and godly life in Christ Jesus will meet with persecution, will be made to suffer because of their religious stand. Happening all over the world. So far we've been blessed in America. I don't know that America is going to... I know America won't escape that in the tribulation period. I hope they escape it up until then. But I don't know. That Trump's going to have to sound pretty quick for that to be a reality. Jesus is talking about the last days in the above Matthew passage. See that verse... Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. You shall be hated of all nations. That's a prophecy by the Lord Jesus Christ. For my name's sake. So I put a note under there. Jesus is talking about the last days in the above Matthew passage. When Paul started this chapter, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy... He was talking about the last days. For he said, And the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. So Paul said, Here's what's going to happen in these last days, because we're falling in love with ourselves, loving pleasure more than... And because we love ourselves, we love pleasure more than we love God. If it feels good, we're going to do it. We don't care what God says. We'll create a new God that agrees with us. Just like they've created a new constitution that agrees with them. You say, what are you talking about? 
There's nothing in a constitution about abortion, but they took a preferred, I mean, a, a, an inferred right of privacy. And justices who are liberal said that right to privacy gives a woman a right to kill her unborn baby. You can't connect that. So because it was settled in the Supreme Court, it's now constitutional that they can kill babies. But it's not constitutional in the sense there's nothing in the Constitution that says such a thing. There's nothing in the Bible that says what people who are calling themselves Christians wanted to say. Nothing. So Jesus said, every nation is going to hate you on my account. We haven't been there yet. We've been privileged in America. Blessed. But there's coming a time Jesus said so. So Paul's talking about the last days here, which are going to lead to that. Jesus was talking about the last days in Matthew 24, and he said, every nation. All right. Jesus and Paul's point is is that this kind of persecution that Paul suffered in the beginning of the church age, we who love Jesus will suffer in all nations in these last days. So again... For most of American history, Christians have been treated well. But now, in these last days, some in America have their sights set on the evangelical church. Now, why is that? As they delve deeper and deeper into loving their own selves, they have desired to put their love of pleasure ahead of their love of God. Romans 132. Remember I said... Romans 116. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And in verse 17, he said, For in that gospel of Christ is where we learn how to be right with God. And then starting with verse 18, we find out why we need to be right with God. And from verses 18 to 32, it's this long litany list of bad conduct. And he ends that list with verse 32 here. That the people who are doing these things that... He condemns in verses 18 to 32, which include homosexuality. He says this about them as he sums it up. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So he saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's going to get so bad. Used to be when I first read that, I thought of Hugh Hefner, who introduced uh, girly magazines to America. Now, some followed him that were much worse than him, but they wouldn't have followed him if he hadn't broke the ice, if he hadn't made the path. And I used to think of him. Hugh Hefner not only takes pleasure, or not only uh, does what he does in spite of knowing what God says about it, but he takes pleasure in those that do them. So we, the minute we decide we're going to live it our way and don't care what God says about it, and decide we'll recreate the God of the Bible and make them different, once we get there, then we want to be surrounded by like-minded people, so we take pleasure in everybody else who's there. That's the way sin works, all right? So, so is this going to get better? Look at verse 13 said, after he said in verse 12, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is it going to get better? Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I'm amazed by that verse. Because I would have argued that a lot of Christians into this political correctness thing aren't deceived, they're just hardened. But Paul said they, they're not only deceived, and they're not only deceiving, but they're being deceived. So the devil is causing them to form their entire doctrine on this theology. God is love. Yes, He is. Amen, He's love. But He's also just. And so they take that phrase and make it fit everything everybody's doing. God is love, therefore all this stuff is okay. So they ignore all the passages of the New Testament that says in Romans uh, 1, 18 to 32 and in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, all these things uh, that are called misconduct or sin, 
they ignore all that and say, because God is love, he's okay with whatever anybody's doing. And I love the book, The Shack, and I love the movie, The Shack. But the truth is, the black lady who played God really gave out the vibe that God sees what everyone does and understands why they're doing it, understands the whole life. That's why some of the church really fought that movie, the church world. Because if you're a Christian and understand the gospel, it's, it's, it's a good movie. But there's an underlying false doctrine there that because God is love, He's okay with what everyone's doing. We don't understand what these people went through in their lives. So there is that, and there's always been that. As a Christian, I enjoyed the book, and I certainly enjoyed the movie. But I can understand why a lot of the evangelical world fought that movie and said, don't go. Because you take someone who doesn't have a strong Christian undergirding, and they watch that movie, Mama is just telling everybody, No, well, she was called Papa in the movie, Papa's calling everybody, telling everybody that they're all my favorite children. The guy said to her, you have a lot of favorite children, don't you? And she said, they're all my favorite children. Um, and so there is a thought there that could be conveyed to the unbeliever. God loved me just the way I am. I don't have to change at all. you got to get saved. And getting saved makes you a brand new creature. It's all in one package. You can't get saved and not change. Salvation means you become a brand new creature in Christ. All right. He's saying these evil folk are going to get worse. Then he said in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Timothy, keep on keeping on, he's saying, and no thing that I taught you and that God had given you assurance of. And then he says, Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Uh, he's a read version, but you should continue following the teaching you learned. You know it is true because you know you can trust who taught you, talking about himself. All right, verse 15. Then he goes even deeper. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, or the New Living Translation. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Again, When you understand the New Testament, you gain the wisdom. You don't have to have full understanding. Billy Graham stood up in Ball Stadium and preached the gospel simplistically, but he taught enough of it so the people in the stands could understand that if I put my faith in God, I can get saved. And the Scriptures give you the wisdom to understand the path to salvation, he's saying to Timothy. And then, one of my favorite verses in the Scripture, verse 16. There's a lot of good 3.16s. John 3.16. Great verse. 1 John 3.16. Fantastic verse. Hereby perceive we the love of God. And 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. New Living Translation, you can tell I like that uh, translation. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. That's what the Scripture can do for you and I. And it's all. Now I want you to... When Peter wrote... I, uh, to be honest, I can't remember if it was First or Second Peter right now. But Peter referred to Paul. And he said, when you read Paul, some of it's hard to understand. And then he went on with his commentary, as all Scripture is. So Peter called Paul's writings Scripture. Well, that was no surprise to Paul. He's saying the same thing right here. He's saying, you've learned the Scriptures, you know what I've taught, and I want you to know that all Scripture. Paul knew what his call was. Peter knew what his call was. Everybody who wrote the Scripture knew what their call was. It was to give us the New Testament. The 
the Old Testament, obviously before that, but since Jesus, everybody who was written, they knew what God was doing with them. He was using them to set down the New Testament for the new church that was being formed. And so Paul has no stuttering whatsoever when he says, uh, you, you've been taught uh, from childhood, certainly. You've been taught from childhood by your uh, mother. But up above, he said, you know what I taught you. And you know that is true because you know me. Now he said, all Scripture. There's no doubt in my mind that Paul is reminding Timothy something that Timothy already knew. This stuff isn't me talking. Now when I teach you, it's me talking. God never called me to write Scripture. I do my best to understand Scripture and to teach you what the writers of Scripture teach. That's my job, is not to write Scripture. I can't tell you that everything I say is divinely inspired of God. I've changed doctrines over the years. Some of the things I said when I was young, I'd like to buy a plane ticket, go back and find those folk and apologize. I didn't always understand the gospel pretty quickly. Um, again, that book um, on the book of Romans, how to be religious, no, how to be a Christian without being religious, what made a huge impact on me. And uh, it was a path, verse by verse teaching through the book of Romans in the Living Bible. And Back then when I was a young preacher, the King James was easy to stumble on. These and thous, you know. And so here was a teaching on a paraphrase that just read like a regular book. And the simple, he would go four or five verses at a time sometime and write a paragraph on them. Because he had a lot to get through in a little book. And it really caused me to see something. And once you saw it, I could go back into the King James and it became plain to me. Because now it had been made plain to me. And so at a very young age, um, I had preached a couple years before I got married. But by the time Barb met me, I was already on the road to understanding the gospel. Wasn't there yet. I mean, certainly not like I am today. But I was on that journey. God had straightened me out and got me because the Pentecostal world that I was involved in was legalistic as all get out. And um, if you were ever around Pentecostal people in those days, um, but and you could uh, be saved today, lost tomorrow, saved the next day, lost the day after that, saved the day after that. Um, and if the trump sounded on the day you were lost, you're going to hell. But good for you if the trump sounded on the day you were saved, you got to go to heaven. Uh, I'm so glad that I have a greater salvation than that. On my worst day just as much as on my best days. I am a child of Almighty God going to heaven. All right. So Paul said, all Scripture, wherever you're studying in the New Testament, wherever you're studying the Old, the only thing you have to remember is the Scripture interprets the Scripture. So when you're studying the Old Testament, you have to remember that something happened between the writing of the New Testament and the writing of the Old. And that's the birth, death, burial, and resurrection, ascension of Jesus. None of the New Testament had been written till after those things happened. The first four Gospels tell us about those things, but they were written after the fact. So what happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament is Jesus. So when you read the Old Testament, you got to make sure that you understand where it is in the program. Barb and I were preaching in Des Moines, Iowa. And a guy named Jerry came forward, never been in church before. His wife was a wonderful Christian lady. He comes forward, accepts Jesus. And uh, because he accepted Jesus, he thought, i, I got to get to know the Bible. So he started in Genesis. He became harder for Judy to live with after he was saved than before. He got became harder for his fellow workers to work with than before. Because 
He was now a New Testament Christian living in Old Testament doctrine. And it taught me something. From that day on, if I pray with someone to accept Christ, I say, now, read the Testament for two years before you open the Old. you got to get an understanding of the New so you can keep the Old in its place. He started in the Old, and he wasn't going to get to Matthew until he got all the way through and so all he heard were all these judgments and all these prophets and all these people uh, saying, God's going to get you and God's going to get you and God's going to get you. And I thought, and then he got, you know, when you get dug in, then I couldn't influence him at all. But it did teach me. Nobody should. Now I know why they hand out the Gospel of John uh, at altars, you know. Nobody should touch the Old Testament if they're new to all this until they have an understanding of the new. We are not under the Old Testament is a contract. We're not under that contract. We're under the new. But there's a lot of things we can learn. There are still things we can learn about the character of God in the Old Testament, but we need to keep, as we learn that, we need to keep it under the understanding of where we're at in the program of God, which is the New Testament. So, all Scripture, even the Old Testament, but Scripture, I love commentary, but the best commentary of Scripture is the Scripture. The best way to explain a verse is with another verse. So, in this case, Paul is teaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not going to find that in the Old Testament. So he said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So, the Scripture will teach me stuff. That's what doctrine is. It's profitable for reproof or rebuke. It's profitable for correction. Man, do we need corrected sometimes. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. How to be right with God. Alright? So, what do we learn from New Testament epistles? We learn what God wants us to know. We learn those things that make us realize what we're doing wrong. We learn those things that correct our bad behavior. And we learn those things that teach us how to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to a holy God. So what do we need to know about the New Testament? It's the very Word of Almighty God Himself. Now not only is Scripture profitable for those things, but then verse 17, the last verse of chapter 4, tells us why that's important. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You say, I don't know any perfect Christian. Uh, Yeah, you do. You just don't know it. It's not talking about sinless here. It's talking about mature. Christians who have grown up in the faith, spiritually speaking. Not grown up as a child, but as a Christian. They've grown through Bible study to become mature believers. Grown up. So, you know, just like a rose in full bloom is a mature rose. It doesn't mean a petal's not missing doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's mature. It's reached full growth. Um, And that's what maturity... The Apostle Paul writes... I'm trying to remember who he's writing to here. Um, ah, He's he's debating me right now. But he, he, in essence, says none of us are perfect. And then a verse or two later he said, We who are perfect. It's a different tense of the same verb. So in the one sense, he's saying none of us are perfect in the sense that we've arrived at every place God wants us to. We're not going to get that perfection until we see Jesus. Lynn's there now. Lynn has seen Jesus face to face in His glory. So what happens when we see Him in His glory according to John and 1 John 3, 2? We become like Him. Lynn is now like Him, like Jesus. You know what that means? If he's looking down from heaven tonight, he he likes my singing. All perfect people love my singing. But but anyway, the point I'm getting at is, after saying, in essence, nobody's perfect, nobody has reached the fullness of their uh, who they're going to be in Christ yet, and we won't tell we see him as he is, then he turns right around and says, but we who are perfect, we who are mature in Christ. So... He's not suggesting here that 
Uh, any of us know the Scripture so well that we are sinlessly perfect. But he is saying that the Scripture causes us to grow up in Christ and become more like Him. Now, we won't become fully like Him until we see Him as He is. In the meantime, we get as close a, a glimpse of Him as we can get in New Testament teaching. And the more I see Him here, the more I see Him here, the more I become like Him. And then eventually, Paul writes in Second Corinthians 3.18, um, that the more we behold, we are being changed into that image from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. So why aren't I more like God yet? Because now we see through a glass darkly. Then, when we see Him as He is, we'll see Him face to face. So, the only way I grow spiritually now is to understand this book, the New Testament. It explains who Jesus is. And so when we read that, we're trying to do more than find a sermon we're trying to get to know Jesus better. Because the more we understand about Him, the more the Holy Spirit transforms us into His likeness. But boy, one day, it's going to be so remarkable. Let me show you what happened to Lynn in closing. Lynn, I've known him for 30 years. Been saved, I don't know if he was saved before then or if he got saved at full gospel. I have no idea. Do you know? But back then, like most Christians, he started growing a little bit, 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 a little bit. Then he closed his eyes in death and <coughs> changed like that. So, no matter how much we get to understand the Scripture, and no matter how much it transforms us into spiritual maturity, it's still like this in comparison to this. We can't imagine what Lynn or any of your other loved ones who have passed away who were saved. We can't imagine. We can't wrap our brain around what happened to them. We can read it. They seen him as he is and became like him. But we can't grasp it. So in the meantime, we just shoot for maturity to be a mature believer. That's all we got here. So we keep shooting for that.